go? I think okay. so. Okay. Welcome to the Homestead Colloquium series. Uh, the Homestead Colloquium is supported by two research centers, Ceres and Kaiser. Both are research centers funded by the Swedish Knowledge Foundation, the KK. The goal of the colloquium series is to bring distinguished speakers from around the world to talk to us about all kinds of subjects relating to embedded and intelligent systems. It's a special pleasure to present to you today Aaron Ames, who is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Texas A&M in College Station in Texas. Aaron Ames finished his PhD at Berkeley in 2006 on the topic of a categorical theory of hybrid systems. For those of us that are not completely familiar with category theory, it's one of the more abstract mathematical disciplines. Um, at the same time, um, Aaron has been doing great work applied, very applied, very practical work on bipedal robotics. And I think that many people would agree that he's a leader in this area. Um, after his PhD at Berkeley, Aaron went and did a postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech from 2006 to 2008. And then soon thereafter, he started his position uh, at the mechanical engineering department at Texas A&M. Aaron Ames is a recipient of the very prestigious NSF uh, Career Award, as well as many other uh, awards, and uh, he is the PI on several uh, research projects. Um, one of the things that I find most impressive about Aaron's expertise is their breadth. Uh, I mentioned that you know, he's done work on very theoretical aspects of hybrid systems, but at the same time, if you look at his webpage, you'll see pictures and movies of his lab where there are a lot of real things that are being built. And they're not just robots, uh, they're actually robots that walk on two feet, which is uh, pretty amazing. So, without further ado, I will uh, let Aaron tell us about his exciting research. Uh, well, thank you please very welcome much. Aaron. Thank you, for that. thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was, that was very nice. So, it's an honor to be here, and I've enjoyed it so far the day I've been here, but I'm looking forward to having more time and talking to people. So, today I want to talk a little bit about bipedal robots specifically. And what I'm really going to try to talk about is this progression from theory to experimental realization, you know. And this is a, this is a long process, but I'm going to try to distill it down into the most important points. So first off, I have to sort of thank my grad students for all the work they did on the hardware and playing around with robots for a really long time. There's actually more additions recently, but uh, we're growing, certainly, our lab. And also, I want to thank the support from all my wonderful sponsors. So to begin with, what's the challenge? To me, this is the challenge right here, for no other reason than we should be able to do it. Uh, and that's human-like bipedal robotic walking. So I don't know if anybody's read Asimov before, but I suggest you do if you haven't. And this is actually the cover off the first edition of his book that kind of started it all, published in 1950, iRobot. So iRobot is not a company now. It's not a movie that was in 2007 with Will Smith. It's not, uh, it's not the robot version of the iPhone. It's this, okay? It's, it's this idea that robots should be among us and live among us and be able to do what we do and help us with our daily lives. And so there's a lot of reasons why this would be an important thing. And some of these are disaster response, space exploration, and then prosthetics, elderly assistance. But really, I want to focus on two kind of motivating examples. So the first one is disaster response. So I don't know if anybody's noticed, but in the, in the States, there's been this really big buzz recently about the DARPA Robotics Challenge. So if you know about the Urban Challenge, this was to have cars drive autonomously. So the Robotics Challenge is to have a robot, a humanoid robot, actually go into a building that's having problems that humans can't go into, fix a pipe, and then leave the building. And it has to walk into this building, it has to walk on uneven terrain, it has to do a lot of things that we can't do yet. And it has to do this in two years, okay? So this really points to me just the need to generate an automatic way of really generating a wide variety of walking behaviors. 
So we can't be limited to this notion that walking is like this, right? As, the, as is standard for a lot of the Japanese robots. We need to really expand the base of walking to be human-like. And something that I find even more appealing is the idea of putting robots in space. To me, this is just cool, okay? And what we should be able to do, I mean, really, the limiting factor in our exploration abilities of Mars is the fact that wheeled robots can't go to the interesting places, okay? We want to go to the polar ice caps, right? We want to actually get in there and test things. And the, the reality is wheeled robots cannot go into those areas. So we need robots that can walk in these areas. And more importantly, this really shows the need to have formal theory. Because you cannot send my team of graduate students to Mars to test the robot for a couple of months to make sure it's ready to go, right? And it needs to be ready to go when it hits the ground in different gravity environments, right, with unknown terrain. So this is actually um, some team I'm working with at NASA right now, the, the Robonaut team. And they built this torso, which is incredibly human-like. And it has wonderful hands and everything like that. And the idea is, can we get to a point where we have a robot like this, something humanoid and wonderful? So I won't have any really cool robots like this. I'm going to have much simpler academic robots. But before I talk about what we do, I think it's important to kind of give a little bit of history. Okay? And, and what I want to start by saying is that everyone here has probably seen ASMO, the, the, the Honda robot, right? And so this robot uses a method of walking that's called ZMP, zero moment point. And so this is actually an example of a robot in my lab walking using this ZMP method. Okay? And you see a couple discerning things about this. The knees tend to be really bent. And essentially what ZMP does is it keeps the dynamic center of mass, let's call it, over the feet. So basically it prevents your feet from rolling. A consequence of that is that you have to walk with flat feet. In fact, the whole theory is built on the fact that your feet don't roll, so they have to be flat. And try, if you ever walk around, try to walk with flat feet. It's, it's impossible to do anything interesting. You can't walk like this with flat feet unless you do something very strange, all right? So the, this notion has been around for a long time, but it was kind of disrupted or, or thrown on its side by this, some stuff that McGear did back in the late 80s, early 90s. And he noticed that mechanically, bipedal robots naturally exhibit walking gates. And these walking gates are not ZMP gates. They're just nice, dynamic, almost human-like walking gates. So this is actually a movie from his first experiment, where he first got it to work, back in April 20th, 1990. So it's pretty impressive. And what's made more impressive is the fact that this robot doesn't have any actuation, right? So it's a purely passive robot able to achieve a rather human-like gait, OK? The problem with this method is that it's, while you can formally analyze the existence of a gait, generating different walking behaviors becomes a challenge, right? How does this extend to walking on an even terrain where you need actuation, right? And so this notion of extending these principles still hasn't really hit its heyday. So as kind of a third counterpoint, I want to mention the work of Jesse Grizzle. And he used this notion of hybrid zero dynamics, which I actually build a lot on his work in my work. And this idea was to use formal nonlinear control methods, specifically zero dynamics, to actually provably generate walking gates. And he's been able to realize this experimentally, which is very impressive, on his robot Mabel in Michigan. It's actually since ran. And I don't have a video of that right now, but you can see some of the walking that he's gotten here. And this is a, so this is a two-dimensional robot, and the boon basically only prevents it from going left and right, but doesn't support it upright. And again, it's, it's a very impressive because he's been able to really translate theory to experimentation very effectively. But I think to truly understand walking and to get real human-like robotic walking, we need to go a step further. We need to really understand the fundamental mechanisms of walking. We can't live in an isolated bubble of theory. We can't live in an isolated buzz, bubble of pure dynamics, right? And we can't utilize methods that we give very conservative approximations. We need to go beyond all those methods. So this is kind of the idea of this talk. And, and the idea is very simple. The idea is let's look at humans, OK? That's very obvious, and it's actually been done a lot. But I'm going to put a twist on it in this talk. The idea is let's look at human walking to motivate the formal development of controllers. So we don't just want to take data and then put it on a robot. We want to use it as a, as a template, as an inspiration for the development of formal control methods. Okay? And then we want to realize these things experimentally. So that's really the basis of my talk. So my talk in a big picture is this. So it was mentioned that I did category theory for my PhD thesis, and I like commutative diagrams. So if you know category theory, this is a commutative diagram. All right? And the idea is we want to start with human data, 
and we want to look at this data for a variety of different walking behaviors. From this, we want to somehow find a representation of this data that's in the simplest yet most general form possible. And we want to use this to generate nonlinear controllers for our robots, which we'll then realize experimentally. Okay, and that's what I'm going to discuss in this talk. So again, what we're going to do to find this representation that's amendable to control is we're going to look for output functions or virtual constraints that seem to encode the essential information present in human walking. All right, once we have those, we're going to define human-inspired controllers and use optimization methods to find the most human-like po walking possible that's simultaneously provably stable. And this is a very key point. We're going to prove a priori the stability of our walking formally. And finally, we're going to experimentally realize, and I'll kind of cap it off by talking about the experimental realization on this robot that we built in my lab, Amber. So, let's get started. Human-inspired control. The idea here is we want to look at the human, but we don't want to look at the entire human system. We want to isolate the parts of that system that encode the behavior essential to walking. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of ignore all this and we're going to view it as a black box. And we're going to define output functions, or virtual constraints, that seem to encode this essential information. Once we have these, we can get a formal model for our robot, right? And we can consider the exact same output functions on the robot that we considered for the human. And then we can use nonlinear control to drive the outputs of the robot to the outputs of the human. So in the end, in some virtual representation, they'll act the same way. So let's kind of talk about this entire process in more detail. So to begin with, we did a bunch of motion capture, which has been done a million times. But we did it again just to make sure we had the right data. And we used a total of 31 subjects, and we computed the three-dimensional position of LED sensors. And to just kind of give you a feel, this is what the data looks like raw, right, after you collect it. OK, and you can kind of shift it along with multiple trial runs and get something like this and average it out and get some nice, relatively smooth behavior from the human. All right. So, but really, the essential point is we don't just want to look at this data. We don't want to take this data and put this on the robot, right? It won't work. Okay, so let's try to find a good low dimensional representation. So let's begin with a, our robot with its joint angles. Okay, let's try to find output functions. That's functions of the angles that give a nice representation. And the ones we specifically look at are, for example, the position of the hip. We want to look at the forward position of the hip over time. Another very important one is one we call the non stance slope. And basically, this is if you take a virtual line and connect your ankle to your hip and you look at that angle of that line from vertical. That's your non-stand slope, OK? And the idea is that humans in their mind, I don't think, have a picture of every joint. Rather, we have some higher level representation of maybe the orientation of our foot relative to our hip. We don't really care about where our knee is, right? So once we do that, we actually get a nice representation. Basically, we're representing the human as this simple compass gate robot, a two-link robot. And all of our outputs yield this representation. Now, the very interesting thing is when we look at the human data for these outputs, this is what we find it looks like over one step. So you notice we've gone from something that's kind of messy and, and not really clear to something that's very predictable. OK? Not only this, but if, you're, if you do any control theory, you look at this and say, this looks like the output to a second order system response. OK? So what you can do is basically take this data and fit the following two functions to it. And these are sort of an essential component of what we do. So the first thing we notice is that the position of the hip is perfectly linear in time. So speed is a direct, a direct function of how fast your hip's going, right? And so the human has a nice constant speed when they walk. Now you notice the remaining outputs follow this exponential cosine and sine function. So what we call is this is the canonical walking function, all right? It's canonical because this same function fits all the other output data. And more importantly, this function actually defines the time solution to a linear mass spring damper system, okay? And when we fit this function to the human data, we get incredibly high correlations. So this is actually pretty exciting, because what we're saying is that it looks like humans, despite all the nonlinearities present in their body, act like a linear mass spring damper system in their outputs. Okay? So once we know this, once we have these functions, we can use this to build controllers. Okay? And this is something that hadn't been noticed before in the biomechanics literature, which was actually rather surprising. Okay, but to build these formal methods now, we need to go to a formal framework. Okay? So if you've done embedded systems, you've probably ran across hybrid systems at some point in the other. So hybrid systems are the way that you naturally model bipedal robots. So specifically, if you look over here, these are actually the phases of walking during a gait that a human displays. Okay? What it really is is the contact points as they evolve over time. So when your heel strikes, then your toe strikes, then your foot lifts, okay? and you go through these contact points. It turns out these contact points 
determine a hybrid system model of the system. So it's very important to understand that, that human walking and bipedal walking are not continuous systems. There's discrete impacts that interrupt the system. As a result, they're defined by a graph, and you can see the graph structure here, along with a domain and dynamics on each one of those modes. So every mode you evolve through has different dynamics, right? And then in addition, you switch between modes based on some guards, okay? So you flow along until your foot hits the ground, then you jump, flow along, jump, flow along. So it's a series of continuous and discrete dynamics. So to kind of put it in a little bit more concrete terms, let's consider our bipedal robot Amber, okay? So this is a two-dimensional robot with point feet, okay? As a result, for our state space, we have a 10-dimensional system consisting of the angles and velocities of the robot, right? Its continuous dynamics consists of an ODE, which can be written in the form f of x plus g of x u. And what happens is it transitions to, it basically resets, the system jumps every time the foot hits the ground or it hits the guard where the height of the foot is zero, in which case an impact equation is applied, and then you reinitialize, okay? So this is the model that we're going to deal with in this talk. All right, so what do we do with this model? The modeling is actually a very important part that's often overlooked. Now, how do we synthesize controllers? So now I'm going to get a little control theoretic for a minute, all right? And so the first thing to note is we had this, what I call the canonical walking function, right? So the first thing is that it's a function of time, and that's not good. You don't want to build controllers on time-based functions. So what we're going to do is use the fact that the position of the hip for the human is perfectly linear to come up with a parameterization of time that's the position of the hip minus the initial position of the hip divided by the velocity. So this is exactly what the human does. For the human, this parameterization of time is basically real time, okay? But for our robot, we can use this as a function of the joint angles of the system to come up with a feedback controller. So this, I'm almost done with the control part, and this is all it amounts to. It's, it's rather simple construction, okay? So basically, here's the human. Think about this as the human, okay? And we have our single canonical walking function representing all the outputs of the human. Okay? Now, this was a time-based function, but we can simply put in our parameterization of time, and we get a collection of parameters for each one of these outputs. Okay? Here's the robot, and these are the outputs of the robot. What's the goal? The goal is to make the, human, or the robot act like the human. So we want to drive this to zero. Right? Okay? So what we're going to do is define a controller that does just that. Okay? If you've seen input-output linearization before, this looks very familiar. If you haven't, don't really worry about it. All right? But basically what happens is if you, you apply this nonlinear controller, which is really you know, kind of complicated and complex, but once you apply it, what this controller does is renders your output dynamics like this. Okay? So pretty much this is your position of your hip or velocity of your hip. So what this is saying is your velocity of your hip should, should go to this constant velocity that the human has. All right? And then the other outputs are going to evolve according to a second order linear system, and those will also go to zero. So this controller drives all of these outputs to zero. So what does it really do? This controller drives the robot to the human. Okay? So the robot will act like the human. Okay? That's really the essential part. And so we can apply this feedback control law to our dynamical system, or control system, to get a dynamical system, and then we get a hybrid system. Okay, so now we're done. We've applied our control to our model. We're done, right? Well, not really, but kind of. Okay. So what happens? So this is a non-formal result. This is where most people would probably stop. We've got a controller, we put it on our system, we press go. It turns out that we can actually get stable walking with this controller using the parameters that were used to fit the, the, this canonical walking function to the human data. If we use all the exact same parameters but only change one parameter, we actually get walking in simulation, which is actually pretty interesting. And let me show you this walking. So this is what it looks like. I'll have less stick figures in the future. So does anybody see a problem with this walking? Is it human-like, aside from the fact it's stick figure? Try to abstract that away in your mind. It's not bad. Anybody notice an issue with it, though? Look at the knee. Anything wrong with that? No, it's... Actually, humans have really long calves. You don't realize it until you look at stick figure representations. But oftentimes, humans' calves are longer than their thighs, which I never realized. It's actually true. Um, I had my students like double check that because it didn't seem right to me. Anyways, what's happening actually? It lock. It's it, no, the knee never locks in humans. Actually, what's happening is that you get big velocity spikes in your knee. Okay, so we'll get pragmatic for a second from an engineering perspective. 
It, look at the velocity up there. It's about 12 radians per second. Can you make a robot do 12 radians per second? You don't want to, okay? Why is that happening, though? It's, it's indicative of something more fundamental, is that this controller we have drives the outputs of the human to the outputs of the robot. But it does not respect that through impact. So when the foot impacts, there's a jump off this surface, this zero dynamic surface, and then the controller drives you back. Okay? But that driving back of the controller causes these velocity spikes. Okay? So the point is that this is a problem. It's not practically achievable. Okay? And we actually have no formal proofs of stability as well. All I did was simulated this and said, look it, we have walking. Okay? So we want to have formal methods here. So we need to do something about this. Um, and I'll say the last thing is that this took a lot of tweaking to get. We had to play around with these parameters by like literally like 10 significant figures sometimes to make this work, okay? Maybe not that much, it was more like five, but still it's students spending hours and hours doing this. So what we need is an automated way that we know will work. All right, so that really gets to the formal results part. So the formal results are built on the concept that we have these outputs, okay? And when we're on this surface where these outputs agree with the human outputs, we actually get a low dimensional representation of the system. So what we're really doing is approximating this robot, or even a more complex robot, by a single degree of freedom pendulum. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to basically try to enforce this low dimensional representation through impact. So I needed to get technical for another minute. And so if you look at this surface here, the blue is what we call the partial hybrid zero dynamic surface. Okay? What this surface is is when the outputs of the robot agree with the outputs of the human. Okay? And the idea is right now we know that surface is attractive, okay? meaning that there's convergence. You saw that in the plots. Okay? The problem is that delta takes you away from the surface. Okay? So long story short, what we want to have is what, something we call partial hybrid zero dynamics. Okay? So what we're going to do is say that okay, when we have this surface intersecting the guard and we apply this impact equation, we want it to again lie in this low dimensional surface. By having that surface be invariant through impact, our entire system will be a low dimensional system. Okay? And in addition, we want to find these conditions subject to some cost that gives us human like walking. Yes? So the red would be the guard or the impact equation, or impact surface. Impact surface. So, for example, yeah, this is a good question. So, in this case, it's the height of the foot above the ground. So, when the height is zero, that's the red surface. Okay, so what we're saying is the blue is the continuous dynamics. So we flow along till we hit the red surface. We have to stop. That's why I did red. And then that, that delta flips you back. And what the flip back does is actually flips your stance and non-stance leg. So now you go. Okay, so you start from this green surface, go to the red, green to red. Okay? So you're essentially catching your error signal and making it so that you... No, it's not an error signal. It's, yes. Oh, he was asking what the red and the green surface were. Oh, oh, in the mic. Okay, so the question was, what is the red surface and what is the green surface? Okay, so the red surface is your, is your guard. And what that means is that tells you when you apply a discrete impact. So it's not an air signal. It's simply a, a dynamics-related construction. So you're flowing along on this blue surface till your foot strikes the ground. When your foot strikes the ground, that's the red surface. Your impact equation causes all the velocities in your system to jump according to some impact law. And then you start going again. That jump throws you from the red surface to the green surface. Okay? Make sense? So the idea is this continuous dynamics, we have this nice invariance of this, of this controller. So we have this low dimensional representation. But we don't know that that's respected through this impact. So the goal is to construct constraints that make sure that is respected. To make sure that the red surface Applying the impact equations to the red surface equals the green surface. Okay? I should do that. I should color them red and green. That's a good idea. Right? But that's really what this means. And we want to enforce this constraint subject to some cost function that gives us the most human-like walking possible. Okay? So, how do we do that? Well, we actually came up with, I, I think I can say, a very clever way of doing this. So the idea is you look at a point on the red surface where the blue surface intersects it. And we can find a point which we call theta alpha. Now this point we can solve for in closed form in terms of these parameters alpha of the system. So what we're doing is we're going to take the state out of the, the whole picture. And we're going to only get conditions in terms of the parameters, the control parameters. And so we can again solve for this point theta alpha, theta dot alpha. 
explicitly in terms of all our output equations. Okay? So by doing this, we remove these from the picture, and we have this very nice theorem, which is what everything we do builds upon. Okay? And basically, we can guarantee this invariance of the surface, partial hybrid zero dynamics, if we enforce these couple constraints. Not only that, but these constraints are purely a function of our parameters. Okay? So it's a nice thing, and it's actually pretty easy to solve this optimization and code it up. Okay? So it's computationally feasible. It can get expensive if you have high dimensions, but it's feasible. And not only that, but I'll show you later that this point theta alpha theta alpha dot is actually going to be the fixed point to a periodic orbit. What does that mean? It means it's actually going to be the starting configuration and velocities to a stable walking gait. So we simultaneously solve this problem and generate walking gates. Okay? And I'll explain the significance of that a little bit more. And let me just kind of really briefly mention how we do this. Okay? The idea is if we have our full dimensional robot, this could be a 50 dimensional robot, it doesn't matter. Right? By using these constructions, we map it down to a single pendulum that's indexed only by the position of the hip. Okay? And basically, as long as we create periodic behavior for that pendulum, Okay, the pendulum goes forward and goes back, then we're actually generating periodic behavior for the entire system, meaning we're generating walking. Okay? So, and not only do we generate walking, but the dynamics are very simple for that system. They're essentially linear. But I'm just going to kind of jump through this because I want to get to the theorem. So, I'm almost done with the math, but let me just kind of put up a little bit more math because I think it's important. And so the idea is if we solve this PhDZ problem, Okay? Then what we have is we have a priori we know that we're going to have a stable walking gait. So we've generated walking. Not only have we generated walking, but we know that the fixed point again is going to be this point. So this is very powerful. All right? And not only does that work for fully actuated robots, meaning robots with, that can actuate their feet and ankle on the ground, but you get a very similar theorem for underactuated robots. Okay? And basically you again can construct this fixed point in essentially closed form. Okay? So we've gone from a problem where we didn't know how to find these control parameters, we had to spend hours tuning them, to one where we just pop them into this optimization problem, and out comes our walking. Okay? So I really, the rest of the talk is going to be devoted to practical issues. So this is the end of the formal results, but this is what everything builds on. Now the question becomes, from a CPS perspective, how well does this implement? Does this actually work? Have we done anything good formally? Okay, so let me really get to that, because I think that's very important. Um, but first, I need to talk a little bit about how we can extend these results. It turns out they're actually quite extensible, and we can do this. We can actually extend these results to get any kind of walking behavior. All you have to do is switch up the parameters. Okay? So let me kind of go ahead on this. All right, so let me go to here. So basically, what happens is you can get walking on flat ground, which we mentioned earlier. You can get walking upstairs, and you can get walking downstairs. Okay? And through this representation, this low dimensional representation, here now red and green, blue don't mean anything anymore. Well, the blue is the same actually, but now this red was blue before. Okay? So the idea is if we have these different walking behaviors and we have this low dimensional representation, all we need to do to transition between these behaviors is just take a strip and basically connect these strips. Right? So we can actually generate a wide variety of walking behaviors. So this, is, so this theorem is applicable to a lot of things, not just walking on flat ground. So let me show you the proofs really in the pudding. I think this is more interesting than all the little formal bits. So here's the walking we get through the different individual optimizations I mentioned. And now what we can do is we can piece this walking behavior together into a single coherent walking, right? That's actually, this is all formally correct modeling, impacts and everything like that, to a nice smooth transition over stairs. Okay? So again, the, the point of this was to generate formal methods for getting these behaviors. All right? And not only that, but being able to generate a wide variety of behaviors. And I think we're on the right track there. So, let's leave it there, and let's talk about experimental results. I really think this is the important thing, is to say, okay, how do these translate experimentally? So let's get out of math world. What? Just before we jump in. Yeah, the, go ahead. So you have these, these ideas of these surfaces in your dynamics matrix, mm -hmm. I guess. Yes, yes. So, and each surface will represent... These surfaces, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. They're, they're really, these surfaces are where your gate lives. Yeah. Your walking gate is inside this surface. Walking up steps will be one surface. Yes, one surface. And mm -hmm. as long as you walk up those steps, you jump from one end to the, the surface to the 
Yeah, yeah. And so I, I kind of skipped over because I wanted to talk about software a little bit more. But I think it's kind of, uh, let me go back to this figure. So you have these individual walking behaviors, right? And then you want to transition between them. Okay? Now the key point is to not do what most people do. Okay? What they do up to date, really almost everybody when they're talking about what composing motion primitives, is they'll say, okay, I'm walking and I'm going to switch my controller to a new controller. The problem is that walking, that doesn't work. If you see stairs coming and you just switch to the stair climbing controller, you're going to hit the stairs. You're going to scuff the stairs. What you actually need is one step in order to transition between those controllers. So the idea here is instead of just having these isolated events that we switch between, we actually define an intermediate event. So we actually get a hybrid system for the edges as well. And that hybrid system consists of one step where we will actually connect the surfaces between these low dimensional representations. You see? So we actually formally model this as a, what we call a meta-hybrid system, which is a hybrid system of hybrid systems. It's a graph in which every node of the graph is a hybrid system and every edge is a hybrid system, which, by the way, have their own graphs. So it's, uh, yeah, it's actually, categorically, this is quite nice if you want me to do some category theory, but I think I'll pass, yeah? How the what force? Sorry. How would gravity influence? So, I mean, the walking itself, like if there were different gravity forces, yeah. Well, the nice thing is if, if you have a correct simulation environment for these things, meaning if you've done the modeling correctly, which is why I spent quite a bit of time on the representation of it, all you need to do is switch a parameter in your model. Gravity is a parameter just like everything else, right? So, but this is a good question. I have not actually done that, and I would like to put in like Mars gravity and see how the walking gate does. But, but theoretically, there's no... There's no barrier with changing these. And again, this really points to the need to automatically generating these gates and having that just be a parameter and knowing that it will be correct when you implement it a priori. And that's the challenge, right? That's what this talk is kind of aiming towards addressing, even though I haven't fully, at least I'll show you some signs that we're on the right track. So did that answer your question with the transitions? Yeah. So the, again, just to kind of stress this, this is actually very important. This is probably one of the most important things that I'll be doing next if I can put something on it. Because if we're going to do this, like, let's say the challenge, okay, we're going to need to navigate all these different things. And so we need to go beyond just walking on flat ground. We need to, and this low dimensional representation gives us a way of very simply connecting these surfaces, right? If we're dealing with the full dimensional model, you'd never be able to do these transitions. So the low dimensional representation we get is essential. All right. Let's talk about experimental realization. Let's, let's go to some fun stuff and look at some robots now, all right? If everyone's kind of temporarily mathed out. Um, all right, so I, I found this quote online. I don't know who said it. If anybody knows who originally said this, let me know. But it says that simulations are believed by no one except those who conducted them, and experimental results are believed by everyone except those who conducted them. Okay, so who believed my simulation results? Like, who thinks that they're actually right? Like, you believe that I could get walking now. Okay, I have some, who, who didn't see my videos earlier online? <laughs> if you hadn't seen my robot walking, would you believe them? I mean, the answer is no, because nobody knows if you're doing the right thing in simulation. It's impossible to know. You could have a bug in there that actually is giving you walking that you don't. So really, experimentation. So I want to start with the failure, because I think failures are really funny. All right, so this is the first time I ran, this is actually the first experiment we ran with this robot, with feet. And this is what happened. So I, I want to show you the, the gap between, you know, a theoretician and an and a experimentalist right here. And so we realized a lot of things through this. First of all, our actual gate looked kind of okay, right? Except for the fact that we couldn't let go and it was doing a bunch of funky stuff. And the first thing we realized is the motors for this robot are actually about this big. They're like the size of a C battery. So I don't know why I thought that a C battery sized motors would get me walking in a full three-dimensional robot, except for the fact that I was, to use internet lingo, a noob, all right? So I was a newbie to this whole thing. So what we ended up doing was, you'll see Amber later, the reason it looks like it does is pure practically, we had to cut off the legs to reduce the weight and put carbon fiber there. So I want to kind of start that out to say that these things aren't automatic, right? It's important to appreciate that. But, but I do want to show you the optimization, because I think this is important. So what I'm going to do here is show you a quick movie of the optimization running. And so this is how we generate walking. So right here, this A0 is the only input to the system. We seed the optimization with the parameters from the human data, okay? And then we're going to run this thing, and so this is, there's no other input to this, and we're going to automatically generate walking, and here you see it going, 
and there's the walking. So that's how long it takes to get walking from human data using this. And not only that, but we know it's walking. Like, provably, we've proved that it's walking a priori, right? So I was, when this first worked, I was just, believe me, you don't know how much time people spend tweaking things to get walking in robots. To have this automatically pop it out was very interesting. Yes? Just a small clarification. Yeah. When you say walking from human data, yeah. you don't mean just replaying data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, yes, mean? not walking. You're right. That's a very good point because that's often confused. So what I mean is we're, we're simply taking those output functions, right? And we're looking at the parameters of those outputs and we're putting those into the optimization and then we're applying this theorem. And what this theorem does is it modifies those parameters, again, to get provable stable walking. So that's really this thing. So we're, we're just using the human parameters to the canonical walking functions as a seed, as an initial guess. And it turns out you, very don't, you don't have to modify the parameters very much to get walking on robots. So actually, let me kind of express this a little bit better through this. So this is the outputs of the optimization versus the human data. Okay? And you can see originally the red line fit really well. right? And so now you see there's minor perturbations in these fits. But it's still incredibly close. In fact, if you look at this, all right, so let me explain a little bit more. This is the outputs of what we call the mean human model. So what this is is a robot with parameters that are a mean human model parameters. Mean human, okay? And these are actually the outputs of our AMBER model. And what's amazing is that these output functions don't change that much depending on the model, right? They're very different systems. And not only that, but we're still essentially within one standard deviation of the human data, meaning we actually have quantifiably human-like walking. And again, this is the output of this optimization. So to kind of quantify that a little bit more, our correlations used to be 0.99 across the board, and now they're 0.98, so we lost a little bit getting robotic walking. But it's still, all in all, very good. And so to kind of give one more comparison, here's the human data played back. Okay, let's, let's put, this is straight up playing back human data. Okay, this is actually the formal robotic walking we get through the optimization and on the mean human model, and this is the robotic walking we get on the AMBER model of our robot. And you can see that at first pass, they actually look pretty much identical, right? But if you look closely, you can see small differences. Uh, so for here, this part of the gate, the knee's a little bit more forward in the mean human model, right? And I don't know, it's, it's really hard to actually catch differences. The point is we're generating very human-like walking. Um, so let's talk about actually implementing this on robots. So I'm going to talk about two robots. We first implemented it on now, which is a three-dimensional, fully actuated robot that's commercially available. Uh, and the second thing we implemented on was a two-dimensional under-actuated robot, which is Amber, which we custom built in my lab. All right. So starting with the now robot, we actually have done this. We started this in 2D, but we've done 3D. And, and this is the walking that is generated from the optimization. Okay. So again, what we did is we ran this PHED optimization, this, this thing I showed you running. Now, for the 3D model, it takes a lot longer to run. I'll be honest with you. But it still runs. And we generate this robotic walking and simulation. And what we did with this robot is we don't have torque control. So we simply took those angles that we generated and put them into the system as desired angles. And the end result is that we got robotic walking. Okay? So the, the point here is that our modeling seemed to be pretty good. Okay? And I'll explain that a little more later. But one good indication that we're pretty close with our modeling is if you look at the experimental versus simulation data. Okay? This is always a good comparison to see. So the simulated data is in red and the experimental data is in blue. And you see that there's pretty good agreement between the two, right? I mean, there's some deviations because we're obviously implementing on a real system and we can't model everything. Um, but let's kind of look at it a little bit more closely and watch the walking itself. So this is now walking with human-inspired control. So I don't know if you think that looks any better than the ZMP walking, but you'll see a comparison in a minute where I think it it actually does look better. But the interesting thing is you can actually see the effect of using the human functions, what we call them, on the walk. And if you watch right here, you can see the foot floats, really wants to push its toe in, and here it wants to heel strike. So even though we're enforcing flat foot walking for practical reasons, it really wants to push in and heel strike. Right? And again, that's a, that's a consequence of the functions we're using. We also did some lateral stability control on it, and it is stabilizing itself upright pretty nicely. Um, different surfaces. Let's, let's jump to the chase. All right, so this is the comparison with our walking and ZMP walking. So our walking's here and ZMP's there. So, yeah, 
What's better? I don't know. ZMP is more stable, but I think our walking is a little more human-like. Not a ton. But it's hard to work. Now is, is a very difficult platform to get human-like walking on. So that is our experimental uh, implementation on now. But I really want to talk about Amber a little bit. So the nice thing about Amber is we built this thing from scratch. So we knew it through and through. Okay? So the idea is, again, we just ran that exact same code pretty much on, on the Amber model. Okay? And that generates walking. Now, in this case, on Amber, we didn't want to do angle tracking, so we actually did a variant of torque control. Specifically, we did voltage control. So we controlled the input of the voltage to the motors, and instead of implementing that full control law, that really complicated nonlinear one I showed you, practically we can't do that in real time. So we had to do this instead. So all we did is we said we took a proportional constant and multiplied it by these outputs, Y. The key point here is that the connection with the formal theory is right here. This alpha star is a result of this optimization. It's the parameters we found. Okay? And once we apply this on the robot, we get this, at least in simulation. So again, this is the torque controller that we formally simulated. This is a simulation of this simplified voltage controller. And you see that, at least in simulation, thankfully, we still get walking. Okay? And not only that, but when we apply it on the robot, it works. So that, that's really the success. So let's spend a little time here. So this is Amber walking, again, taking this optimization and just popping it down on the robot. And we get very good agreement with the simulated walking. If you can abstract the stick figure walking from you know, a real robot doing it. So it, again, this is a two-dimensional robot. So it's not being supported in this plane. It can fall. But it is being supported in the side-to-side -side plane. So the really interesting thing was not that it walked, but the way it reacts to disturbances is actually, I think, rather incredible. So when we push it around, it kind of catches itself, right? And there's even this interesting kind of reflex effect that happens. Again, we don't really understand why it does any of this except for the fact that we seem to be using functions that are characteristic of walking. So. It also can handle little disturbances in the terrain pretty well. Except when it misses them. <laughs> you have to, it can step over obstacles too, look it. <laughs> so the interesting thing about this is that it, um, I think the big one's next, yeah. So the interesting thing about this, again, is we're not changing the controller at all. This is just robustness properties. And it can do this double support kind of catch. So this is the part I was actually really amazed at. And so I, I played in slow motion here. But I think this is a function of the fact that we're using these human-inspired functions, right? So it steps. And if you ever step down a step and you don't know it's there, right, you kind of dangle your foot for a second, right? And then you're sort of going to do this little stutter step to catch yourself, swing out your leg to catch your momentum, and then continue going. Now, this is really important, because if I tried to actually program a controller that did all those things, I would have no idea how to do it. I mean, or it'd take me a long time to do. Let's put it that way, right? So that's, it really speaks to the importance of having good control. So it can fall, but I'll show you that later. So the other interesting thing, and, and this, this to me was, was a very good success. So the idea was we had this optimization. It took us a while to initially get walking on Amber, but once we kind of figured this out, we decided we're going to go for climbing up a slope. So I actually went into my lab one afternoon changed one parameter in the code, kind of like gravity, and pressed play in the simulation, got this uh, walking in simulation, and then we put it on the robot and it worked the first time. So that's really the goal of doing this. Now, I'm not saying that will always happen, but in this case, it actually worked. And so this is an example of some other, uh, other let's go right to the walking up a slope. All right, so we actually get it walking up a shallow slope. And this is the first time it actually ran up the slope. And you see it has to kind of drag itself up the slope. Now the interesting thing is these motors are very low power. So we could only, actually we could have done bigger slopes except for the fact that we just ran out of power. This is the biggest slope we could do. Any bigger slope it just couldn't pull itself up the slope. And so this is a simulated walking we generated. And you see that the, there's fairly good agreement between them except that this one goes quite a bit faster because of friction or the lack thereof. Um, but I won't go into that. All right. So let me talk a little bit about, so all right, so this was the success story, I think. All right, the success story was going from formal theory, and I have a theorem, and I put it on the robot, and it works. What's the, 
what's the not good things about what I did, which you don't always see in talks, okay? The not good things is this is what we do to actually implement all these things, okay? So we start with SolidWorks, where we model our robot, right? And then we pass the SolidWorks robot parameters, mass inertia, to Mathematica. We generate the equations of motion in symbolic form in Mathematica, and we pass those to MATLAB, where we do this optimization and simulate the system. Once we have the parameters for the controller in, in MATLAB, we pass those to LabVIEW, which talks to the robot through hardware. Okay? So we're doing four different operating systems just to get it to here. This doesn't mention some of the Perl scripting and things like that that we do in the middle to translate everything around. All right? So this is, a, this is a microcosm of, honestly, I think this is what a lot of things times happens in robotic systems. Okay? There's no coherent, unified thing because SolidWorks gives you the best inertia, right? Modeling. Okay? Mathematica does symbolic stuff the best. So you use what's the best at that specific thing, and then you get these kind of structures. So again, to kind of reiterate, you know, SolidWorks does all this stuff. Mathematica does great because we can generate these controllers symbolically, so they evaluate very quickly. We can generate inverse kinematics. That point on the surface we do in closed form, so it, again, generates very quickly. Um, this is the problem, and this is what I want to mention. So this is the inertia matrix for a two-dimensional robot. This is an equation, by the way. Yeah, this is an equation. So this is the kind of things you run into when you do what I just said. You use each program for its strengths, but any one program is still not great. Okay, so we get this symbolic equation, which I couldn't make it any bigger. And this is actually a relatively small. If you go to a three-dimensional robot, we actually get equations that are over a megabyte. So that's a megabyte worth of sines and cosines, and you can only imagine. Okay, yes? Those come out of Mathematica. So they're automatically generated at symbolic. We don't write them down, right? It's not, it's not on paper. But we use, we use sort of this exponential twist, Murray Lee Sastry stuff to automatically generate the equations of motion, and this is what it gives us, right? So we, we have tricks that we play. Like we'll actually do some specific symbolic expressions and then combine them numerically in MATLAB. And we have ways of trying to reduce the computation, but this is what would happen when you just spit it out directly, right? I mean, you always need Mathematica to get the equations of motion. Now, you can do the equations of motion numerically in MATLAB, and we've implemented that as well. The problem is that's slow, too. It's not slow because you have a big equation. It's slow because it has to do a numerical calculation every step of the way. So the nice thing is MATLAB can evaluate symbolic expressions very quickly. Okay? So much faster than doing some numerical multi-step thing. The problem is, is that at some point, the symbolic expressions become so big, they actually become very slow, too. So there's no, it turns out it's a lose-lose, because we've gone to MATLAB to do everything numerically, and it's just as slow as the symbolic for different reasons, right? So really, computation is a, is a big problem, right? So just to kind of reiterate the MATLAB thing, the idea here is that, again, we pass all this Mathematica stuff, and to get these control parameters, and this is the output that we get. I've kind of talked about that already. So let me talk about the implementation. So once we use MATLAB, MATLAB gives us these wonderful stick figures that you saw walking across the screen many times, right? Okay? More importantly, it gives us these control parameters. So the only thing we take from MATLAB in the end is basically, let's say, uh, depending on, for AMBER, it's going to be like a 5x5 five five matrix. That's the only information we actually need after these megabytes of computations, a 5x5 five five matrix. Okay? And we take that 5x5 five five matrix and we put it right here, alpha. Okay? And then when we implement in lab view, we actually have a very simple thing where we basically look at the encoders and calculate the leg angle. So this is all very pragmatic stuff. We have a guard detection algorithm. This is actually essential and very important where we look at the foot and see if it's hit the ground. It's a very small thing, but it's really essential. And that's in the FPGA. Then we pass it in and we do that simple proportional controller, taking the output from MATLAB, feeding it in, generating impulse waves and putting it on the motors. It's that simple. So the entire code that we implement on the robot is right here. That's all of it. Okay? So in the end, we get this very simple code structure. Right? We, I mean, the end result is a very simple implementation code. And I think one of the reasons it works so well is because it's so simple. So I, I sort of have this conjecture that simplicity implies robustness. All right? And I think that's true. We found that in human walking. Human walking seems to be very simple when we actually break down the data for it. Similarly, this was very robust because it's so simple. We're not trying to do anything crazy, right? Um, 
So that's the end result. But the, the important thing is to really point out this fact that we're, this whole process needs to be improved. Okay, and I think this is a big part of cyber physical systems. So I think that's a good place to kind of leave things off with some open problems. So what did I do in this talk? I hope at least I convinced you of this big picture. And the big picture that I was trying to convince you of is that, first of all, we need formal methods. Okay, they're very important. But we also need an appreciation how to practically realize those formal methods. Okay, so the idea was to look for the formal method side, human data and really distill out the essential parts of human walking to get formal controllers. And then I went through some of the details of how we actually implement those controllers on the robot itself. Now, that being said, there's a ton of things to do still, okay? I indicated some of these different motion primitives. What we need is a better ways of automatically generating a wide variety of motion primitives and how to transition between those motion primitives in a computationally tractable way. Okay, so for example, we talked about creating these surfaces, connecting different motions. The problem is that takes two hours now, because that's an optimization in itself. If you're walking, you do not have two hours to hit a surface and decide, okay, I think I'm going to do this now, right? You need to actually probably try to get this to real time on the robot. So we need to go from two hours to like 10 milliseconds, all right? And that's really the challenge, two hours to 10 milliseconds, all right? And there's a lot of other fun theory to do on the, on the purely control side of things. So we have control Lyapunov functions that we've recently did some stuff, me and Jesse, on applying control Lyapunov functions to these systems. If you, if you know these things and like them, talk to me. Um, a lot of other things like inverse optimality. The question is, can we remove the human data from the picture altogether and actually try to intuit the cost function that humans seem to use when they walk? It's a very big, I mean, that could be a very big contribution. Doing some more CPS related things, abstractions and bi-simulations, for example. I mean, this is potentially very big because we've reduced our entire walking system to a two-dimensional system. So we can now do discrete abstractions of that system, right? Before, we would never have a chance with dimensionality. And finally, category theory. I had to put that on the end. But actually, there's some very nice constructions in category theory that are applicable in the case of motion transitions. So that's, that's some fun things to do. Just to kind of tell you where we're going, this is AMBER 2. It's currently being tested in our lab right now. And so the goal is to do what we did before, but actually even streamline this process. And really, again, be even more throughput from theory to experimentation. Okay? For example, implementing the exact controllers that we do in, in the simulation to get the really good walking, rather than doing the PD controller at the back end. So a lot of very interesting challenge, and we're going to actually try to get a lot of interesting walking behaviors on this robot. Stair climbing, skipping, jumping, have it do a backflip, you know. No, but, but fun stuff, whatever we can get away with with the actuators. And eventually we want to go to full-on three-dimensional robots. Um, another very interesting challenge is actually taking these ideas, since we have this strong human motivation, and translating them to prosthetic devices. So currently the control on prosthetic devices is very limited. Okay, it's very simple and, and I dare say stupid. <laughs> Pretty much what they amount to is when the foot impacts the ground, it stiffens. When the foot's off the ground, it kind of relaxes, and that's about the sole extent of control on prosthetics. So if we can use this really human-like walking to get great walking, why don't we use this to try to improve the quality of life of people? And so also trying to realize some of these things towards space exploration. And finally, um, if you want more information or more videos and watch these things again, I am so obsessed with robotic walking that I bought the domain Bipedal Robotics. So... <laughs> That's my lab website, bipedalrobotics.com. And I want to finish with one more fun little video of Amber where, so the story behind this is that I was gone for Christmas and my students were still in the lab working, and, uh, which is awesome. This is Shashir. And, uh, and they decided, let's see how far we can push the robot till it breaks. Okay? So they decided, that first they were very conservative. They slowed down the treadmill. That's, that's not a big deal. Should be able to handle that. And so the interesting thing is that when they slowed down the treadmill, the walking compensates for the speed difference, which is, again, rather surprising. It sort of slows down its legs. Now, here's the balance test. Now they start putting it through its paces a little bit more. Gets progressively better, by the way. So now they say, okay, what happens if you're walking and somebody pushes you when you're walking? And it sort of does it, actually, admirable job of catching itself. Um, so if, if, if you're walking along and somebody pushes you, you're probably going to do something like this. You're probably going to throw your leg back, right, and be like, and then come forward and catch yourself. So let's try now hitting it with wood. That seems like a good idea, right? 
because it's, it's a very robust robot, so let's take a board and, and hit it. <laughs> so, but it, it can actually handle pretty good disturbances in the hit department. He's being pretty gentle, I think. Yeah, it's not too bad. They do end up breaking it, by the way, so it's, it's coming up. You'll see it. All right. And then next is some disturbances. So actually they decided, I mean, you saw the couple board, the two board test earlier. So they actually did a three board test now just to see what would happen in a minute. The thing is, this is kind of cool because this is repeatable, right? You see it does the same thing whenever it walks over an obstacle. Now it says, let's just do more. All right. And since you've seen this many times, let's just, ah, we'll watch it. So again, it does this nice thing where it steps on the boards and kind of says, oh, I wasn't quite expecting that, so I think I'll take a little short step and come back. Um, the next one's interesting because it does fall, which I think makes things more interesting. <laughs> yeah. There's a limit, right? <laughs> it tried. It tried. So this is some fun outtakes. I like this. So first it would catch the end of the treadmill sometimes. and Yeah, it looks like it hurts, doesn't it? And here's where it breaks. Watch the knee right here. It explodes. And it wasn't just the outside. Actually, the entire knee literally exploded. The welds inside, everything just, just blew. So <laughs> it was about a month till we fixed all that, actually. So... But hey, I don't, as long as they're the ones that fix it, I don't mind at all. So anyways, all right, so that's my, my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions from the audience? This is it Bertil? So you, you, you know that the European experience uh, changes, unexpected changes, uh, and, and yes. you show no. 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 That's a very good question, actually. And yeah. I, yeah. Oh, so the question is, the the we put unexpected disturbances on our robot right now, and it handled them very well. But the question is, is there any future plans for dealing with this in a more formal manner, and especially with regards to learning? And this is a very good question because yes, we're thinking about it. Um, and, and part of this is, is a twofold thing. So part of it's we want to be able to sort of formally, again, connect these surfaces. And the question is, can we formalize this notion of, of updating the parameters continuously to handle these uneven terrain? Okay. Now, that doesn't quite address the learning question, but it turns out we've started doing some work in this area. And so what you're doing is every time your foot strikes, you update these parameters dynamically. The problem is, is they tend to float. Okay, meaning at the first couple steps they're okay, and then you start getting into some really weird thing and you kind of degrade, right? And why is that? That's because there's no real guidance, okay? There's no high level thing saying this parameter trend is probably really bad because we're starting to, you know, our center of mass is starting to get really low. So I, there needs to be a higher level controller. And I think something like learning or, or, you know, some sort of formal guidance in that process of updating the parameters could result in some really interesting outcomes. So yes, it's a very rich question. Um, and really it ties into something more important. Uh, when we're looking at walking right now, we're really basically saying, let's look at the low level walking behaviors present in humans. So if you think about it, when you're walking, you can type on your cell phone or talk on the phone. It doesn't affect your walking, right? But when you actually go to do something more elaborate, like if somebody gives you stepping stones, and if these stepping stones are like 100 feet above the ground, you're probably going to be very actively thinking about going over those stones, right? So robustness to disturbances in, in really diverse terrain requires some cognitive load. And so learning, that's where learning comes in really, is, is that high level, higher above what we're doing level control. So yeah, very rich, very rich. We're, we're heading in that direction, that's but it's obviously, obviously very, very challenging. challenging. So, so. Uh, Magnus? In, in most of your videos, uh, the robot has no shoes or uh, foot. Uh, mm -hmm. How, how important is feet? That's a good question, too. Um, I think they're very important, despite the fact that our robot doesn't have feet. 
Um, I think feet are not so important for walking on flat ground at a steady speed. In terms of the fact that you can achieve rather human-like walking in that context even without feet. Okay? And I think our robot displayed reasonably human-like walking considering how different it was from a human. Now, that comes at a cost. What feet do is they really reduce the overall actuation in the system, especially if you have compliance elements in those feet, right? But more importantly, feet are absolutely essential to running and, um, or at least interesting running behaviors, going up and down stairs in an efficient manner, I mean, and especially uneven terrain. So if there's any chance of doing, I mean, you could do it without feet, but feet really have a stabilizing effect that is essential. The problem, in, and part of the reason we didn't use feet at all, is because to date, most walking has been limited by the use of feet, meaning the ZMP point, basically that ZMP point I mentioned has to be in the shape of the feet. Okay? So by not having feet, you're clearly demonstrating that you don't need to use ZMP methods. So it's a good way of kind of saying, look, we can get this nice dynamically stable walking. Now, I really think true human-like walking is some combination of these. You know, ZMP is important for part of the gait, but then part of the gait you're in essentially an under-actuated mode where it's like you have a point foot. So, so the real answer is they're important, but they're not everything, if that makes any sense, right? It's, it's really, walking is a balancing act. <laughs> in every respect, not just the dynamic balancing, but it's a combination of so many interesting interplay factors. You have to kind of break it down into its most component elements, and then we could start putting it together into what it should really be. This all relates to what Bert was saying here. If you have this transition from walking on the plain grounds and mm -hmm. uh, on the stairs, we saw that stick figure mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, did you then switch to sort of controller parameters uh, yes. somehow magically? Yeah. Yeah, 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 we did. I mean, what we had is, uh, what we initially found was these control parameters, this alpha, okay, for walking on flat ground, walking upstairs, and walking downstairs. And then we, we specifically constructed this surface between those other surfaces defined by those parameters. And then, yes, we sort of magically switched. We told it when to switch, okay? We said, the stairs coming, you're going to have one step till you go there, and then you're going to go up the stairs with these new control parameters, and then you're switch and switch and switch. So this is, again, where cognition comes in. The human tells its body when to switch. I really do think we have this notion of motion primitives. Okay? When we're walking and we don't have to think about it, even going upstairs, you don't have to think about it. When you know the stairs and you're comfortable with them, you don't have to think about it at all. So you're in, you're, you've sort of, your, your brain has said, these are the parameters I want. Now just do this and you're fine. Okay? But where cognition comes in is how you switch between them. And that's where the visual system comes in. That's where the rest of our, our body plays a role, is we have to see some stairs coming. We have to assess the height of the stairs, the breadth of the stairs, the depth, right? We have to say, okay, I'm about one step out from those stairs. Now I'm going to do a transition behavior. You land in that transition, and now you can look up again. And, and I do this a lot when I'm walking. I'm always noticing what I'm doing because this is what I do, right? But if you watch yourself, you realize that that's exactly what you do. About a step and a half out, you, or two steps out, you look at the stairs. One step out, you do your transition behavior, and then you'll look up again. Everyone does this. You look down, and then you look up, and you process. So this is, this is where the up above parameters are coming from, I think. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Have you thought about jumping? So you have a, mm. a gap that you would jump over? Yeah, I, we've not done jumping specifically, but we've done running now with this control methodology, and we can get running from the human data. It turns out that running, humans still follow this pattern. Those, these outputs are still expressed by these same exact functions. So we've, and jumping is really sort of uh, related to, to running. Because running you have, what it really is about is getting enough momentum so you leave the ground. So jumping would be interesting. The question is, you know, the problem is that we have this structure and, and the good thing is that it works well right now in a constrained context in the sense that computationally it, it works, it converges, we get walking, but it's not super efficient yet. So to take it to this next level, if we're going to generate running and jumping and, you know, back skipping, we need a way of automating this throughput in a computationally efficient way. So really the, Im the, the limitations right now is computation more than formal methods. Yeah, it really is very much computation. So, mm-hmm.
at least robots walking into um, a rescue area or something. Maybe the, the human way of walking is not the optimal one. Maybe yeah. the robot could surpass. Yes, the yes. I, I actually. Surprising or not, I get this question every single talk I give. Somebody asks me, no, no, it's okay, it's a great question. And so I'm going to give you my, my, my answer. And my answer, oh, oh, so the question was, maybe there's a better way to walk than what humans walk. And, and I have to say that, I mean, it's a very good question. And then, you know, the heavy human dependence might make you question whether there's a better way, right? Um, so I would answer this in a couple ways. And the first is that I think humans have done a great job through evolution, through, you know, millions of years to, to reach a local minima. And not only is it a local minima, meaning locally optimal, okay? It may not be globally optimal for all circumstances, but it's locally pretty optimal. And I think that evolution has done a good job of finding a pretty big basin of attraction, if you want to use sort of optimization. We have a nice big bowl that we live in for our walking gait. That doesn't mean there's not something better out there but it means that it's probably pretty hard to find if evolution hasn't found it. it. This is all philosophical, but this would be my argument, okay? And so from a purely philosophical level, that would be my answer. Human, if we can decompose human walking, the other thing is then maybe we can say, okay, if this is what humans do, for example, if I can find the cost function that humans minimize, maybe there's a better cost function that gives us better walking. But once we know that cost function, we say, well, what happens if we weight them differently? What happens if we throw in something different, right? And you might actually get some really interesting new behaviors. So that would be my other answer to that. But I, all in all, I think that humans, at least the problem is we can't even recreate that walking. So we have no chance of doing something better at this point. You know? and, and really, most of robotic walking is kind of shooting in the dark right now. Just saying, let's try this, let's try that. And, and you know, sometimes it works. But again, ZMP is a great example. So the zero moment point that I mentioned earlier is actually a method that is what humans don't do that is proved to be locally optimal for a robot, meaning it generates robotic walking, but it's clearly much less optimal than what humans do. It's more energy intensive, right? A lot more behavior. So I think the idea is to look to humans at least to start. If I can, I give a long response every time I answer this question too, so don't take it the wrong way. But I, I think there's, there's, uh, there's a lot to learn here. Yeah. I have a related mm -hmm. technical question. Yes. Yeah. In the now, is it measurable the amount of energy that's used when it does the ZMP versus, versus ours? Yeah. We, we tried to measure that. Now, I know in simulation we verified we had much more efficient walking. The problem is we couldn't actually calculate the power usage on the robot itself because it, of the way it was set up. We couldn't isolate the CPU usage from the motor usage. It was, we tried. We spent some time trying to isolate the exact parts of the power that were being used by locomotion only, and it was impossible to kind of determine that out of the, out of the system. But I, at least theoretically, we have much more efficient walking, twice as efficient, actually. Wow. Yeah, theoretically. And actually, I have to say, Amber has the unique distinction of being the most efficient uh, underactuated, in terms of onboard power, the most efficient uh, underactuated robot that's ever been built. It used, its motors are, are very low power. So, I mean, in terms of onboard motor power, no robot has had that little power and been underactuated, meaning not like a passive robot. So, like this. Yeah. Thank you. Tony, you had a question? My question is, the idea is in energy. You created this very simple model now, and I can't tell you simple model. Mm -hmm. If you add the like the body of the leaves and the horns, mm -hmm. it would maybe uh, save energy, but it yeah. yeah. would also reduce the calculations yeah. yeah. looking at how to keep the calculation as low as possible. I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's a good question. So the so question, question was, was see, I'm, I'm learning now to repeat the question. <laughs> um, the question was if, we, if arms were added to the picture, could you get more efficient walking? Long story short, right? If we increased the model and made the model more complex, could we actually get um, better walking? And I think long answer, or I'm sorry, short answer is yes. Yes, very much so. Okay, so, and I want to kind of augment that by saying that our Amber robot didn't have any compliant elements in it either. There was no springs or dampers. That damping behavior you saw was a function of our controller, not a damper or springs in the system. 
So I also think that adding springs and dampers would make it much more efficient if you do the right exchange of power. Okay? But going back to your question, um, I think walking, or I think arms actually, they, they minimize energy to some degree. I think what they really do is increase stability. They really, the moments that they create get this forward motion in a much more smooth fashion. So what, why don't we have arms? Well, there's no real constraint to using arms in our framework. You can add those degrees of freedom to the model. You could use these functions to drive the arms forward. Um, we haven't actually looked at human arm data, but I'd be willing to bet $100 right now, if anybody wants to take up, 100 American dollars, that humans in their arms, when they're walking, follow these canonical functions with correlation 0.95 or above. If anybody wants to take me up on that, they can compute it. Correlation 0.95 or above, 100 bucks right now to the internet, if people are looking at this on the internet. This goes out to anybody. If they don't, I would be surprised. The point is that the, the real limitation is computationally, I mean, as you increase the number of degrees of freedom in the system, Okay, running this optimization, we can actually calculate the solution to the system in closed form using these methods. So we actually don't have to integrate the dynamics, but we have to run that solution through the dynamics to check like torque and all these practical considerations in the optimization. So as you increase the degrees of freedom, the model becomes much more complicated and the optimization would now take like two weeks if we did a full humanoid model. So really the limitation is not so much that this theory wouldn't work, it's that computationally we can't handle it yet. Yeah. I'd love to, but we can't. Go ahead. Yeah. You mentioned it uh, with dampers, that you need to keep the dampers as few and small as possible, and only used to stabilize. Oh, you adding dampers? Preserve the energy in springs, more or less. Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much, much yeah. yeah. That's what, that's what they'd be used for. Springs, I think, are even more important. I mean, so what we found, again, what our canonical walking function is the time solution to a linear mass spring damper system. So we can actually back out of that spring constants that would be ideal to use, okay? The problem is that the springs are stable springs on the stance leg when you're, right? But they're unstable in the rest of the person, right? Because obviously you need to inject energy into the system, so it's like an unstable spring. And so we've actually added springs to amber. The problem is what we found is if you add a spring to the knees, let's say, okay, with our current mechanical design, you'll save energy on the knee, but you lose energy because now you have to bend that spring in the spring. Right? So, so what I actually think we need is some good mechatronic design where there's actually some way of switching springs on or off, right? depending on what part of the gate you're in. And I think this is kind of what humans do. They have the ability to, to when we tense our muscles, we're not just creating force, but we're actually creating spring tension that we can actively modify throughout the gate. So in some sense, what we're, we're, again, we're actively sort of, we have a nonlinear spring that we're dynamically changing through the gate that really gives us our efficiency. So that's, that's, I think in terms of a purely mechanical design perspective, that's a way to go, except I'm not a big mechanical design person. I just, I build the simplest robots I can that will work. Yes, go ahead. Kangaroos from this energy. Oh, kangaroos, yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good idea. They, they, yeah, they're amazing in their ability to act like springs in, right? Springy systems, yeah. In fact, another thing that related to energy consumption is, is uh, in running. Um, again, we found that running satisfies these functions. So it's been you know, postulated, or, and there's some papers supporting in biomechanics, that really good runners are essentially almost perfectly efficient. You know, if you look at them over a running gate, they lose almost zero energy, right? If you're running for hours and hours on end. So I really would wonder, analyzing running from this perspective, do you find that humans, when they're really good runners, they essentially make their springs, the, the, you know, the unstable springs become more stable, right? And everything kind of converges to a marginally stable system. So it'd be really interesting to study springiness. I, I really think this is a fun thing to do, except that I'm not a biomechanics person, so the, I'm more interested in the middle part. But I, I think there's some really interesting challenges here, yeah. All right. Aaron, uh, thank you very much for thank you. this wonderful presentation. There is this nice tradition here in Sweden of presenting the speaker with a small gift. Oh, wow. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for having me. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. We have some small coffee and cookies outside, so I'd like to invite everybody to join us for that. Thank you. Okay.